Welcome back to Sunday Vibes, one and all. We are back in the pub with a slightly smaller table, but the OG lineup in the building. Pat's wearing a cap, Hamill's wearing a f nice shirt, a bit of chest hair Thank plodding you. out the top of it. This and is like an audio earring. description, mm. you know? Yeah, I don't, we don't put this out This on is podcast, my absolutely. retired director of the CIA look. <sighs> how, yeah. how you feeling? Miami look. Yeah. The Miami this, is, look. this is like James Bond's like... Miami informant. I like it. You've, you you die at like two scenes. Professional later. snitch. You've yeah. gone one button. <laughs> you've gone one button lower. Yeah. Despite it being colder than last week. Yeah. Or the week before. But it's not actually cold, is it? No. It's, it's muggy. Not. As AF. It's not. You wishful like, thinking. You like, wishful you thinking. Like you could stroll onto Steve Irwin's like ranch and just rustle up a few crocodiles. All right, Yeah. Like Thank you. you. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, should we talk about some football though? Yeah. I think we should talk about some football because there's lots going on in the world of soccer right now. Uh, we're talking about panic buys today, aren't we? Panic buys Whee! in the market because United are doing panic buys. <laughs> it's, it's supermarket sweep and we're at the middle of August. Uh, what do we think about Man United's panic buys this week? And are we classifying <sighs> Casemiro as a panic buy? Yes. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's a bad buy. But it is a panic buy. All right, but go on, because we were all speaking about this before the show started and we didn't arrive at any sort of consensus or conclusion. None of it was that, like, intelligible. So, yeah, no one said anything that you were immediately <laughs> no. Just like, like oh, yeah, that, that'll make sense. So <laughs> yeah. we were like, yeah, like, okay, he's an actual DM. He is. That's, that's good. Congrats. I think that your team will be better immediately with him in it because he is... I think overall a better defensive midfielder mm -hmm. than Fred. He's a marginally better passer. He's not a particularly great passer, but he is a better passer. Yeah. He's a worse runner. But he's going to sit in front of your back four, should probably be a back five, and protect it. Uh, and that's good. That's better than not having somebody do that. <laughs> Which has been the case for years. So from that point of view, it makes sense. But I also look at the season and I think even just looking at the results of your first two games, this season is kind of gone. Like Arsenal last season, wow. right? Arsenal last season torched like torched their season in the first three games. If well, you Arsenal really though, you had a, you had a bit of a remontada towards the back end. Yeah, if but, you hadn't flaked out at the end of the yeah, season. Yeah, but losing like those nine points and a huge amount of goal difference early doors was then a massive problem. It meant that like Arsenal really struggled to come back, and we could have done. Is it. Is the barometer but here getting back harder. into the Champions League? Is that what you mean by torched their season? Because well, the, there are five teams who aren't going to give up many points. That. Well, exactly. But but given that you're nowhere yeah. near that, why go and buy a thirty-year-old for sixty plus Very ten with plus huge wages when you could just say what we've been saying Barcelona should say and just face the fact that you're not going to be particularly competitive next year or the year after mm -hmm. and say maybe in three years time we will start to look like a football team uh, you know rather than like the VIP area of a club like it just doesn't really make sense to me I, I don't really understand how you've gone from Frankie to Casemiro it's one of those things isn't it where sometimes you see the list of players publicised mm. and you think these guys have no idea what they're doing and so it's like De Jong Rabio, Casemiro, yeah. Milinkovic, Savage, you're like, great. All is, totally, totally similar kinds of guys. It is a little bit like sort by position on career mode right now, isn't it? Mm. No, it's rating. It's rating. It's just like, Frankie, what, what's his potential? Oh, 92. Oh, we've got Casemiro. He's an 89. Get him in. We're back to buying for the here and now as well, aren't we? Manchester United rather than so. planning for the oh, future. Zero here and now. Like, you're not going to win a trophy this season, are you? Unless you, like, luck a, whatever we call it now, the League like, Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Who cares? Uh, it's... it's it is bizarre. Silly. It is bizarre. And I totally agree that Man United right now are not in a position to be challenging for the Champions League. Certainly not in a position to be challenging for any sort of major honour. Let's put it that way. So surely the better and more logical plan is to say, OK, we might finish eighth. We might finish ninth. But what we are building here allows us to get up to those levels in the next two yes. to five years. Yes. That would be the smart play, and apparently, mm. and seemingly, that's what Arsenal have done, and they've they've taken some hits in the short but term to do that. What this says is United are so that. scared at the prospect of doing that with mm. their current squad that they feel they have to no, I reinforce that. It the, mi that. the middle of the pot with someone like Casemiro. I don't think it does say that. I think it set, it speaks for the fact that they just do not know what they're doing at all at any level yeah there's no there's no clarity but I think if they there's no plan for sure but if they brought in some young players now start to try and blood mm. them into the side people that we you, you think potentially have the right profile 
I think they probably get their ass handed to to them. And there's no plan to do that though. But that's the thing as well. Like that's where your manager, right, needs to come out, or, or somebody needs to come out and be an advocate for doing it. Mm. So like, it, it would be fair enough to say rather than getting some big names in, we're going to buy you know three or four prospects and we're going to add them to a squad, which actually already is like. It does have loads of really good players. Like, it's not hard to cobble together a decent team. Come on, man. Like, you still have, like, Varane. Lisandro Martinez is a useful player. Maguire is certainly a useful player, despite what United fans say. Sancho's a great player, if you can get him, like, functioning. Bruno is a fantastic player. Like, there is a team in there. And it just feels like you need someone like Ten Hag to come out and say, guys, we're going to buy some players who may not be, you know what you consider to be like top of the market. And for a couple of years, we're not going to be achieving the things yeah. that you are used to expecting as Man United fans. But the whole point is not that we are in a good position in two years' time, but that we continue to be in a good position for the next 20 years. Mm. That is what we've got to do. And this is one sense in which Arsenal kind of got lucky because while we all had very legitimate questions about Arteta early on, yeah. like, I think he did some pretty bad coaching. There were some really odd squad decisions. He was always a great communicator, right? Yeah. He came out and like was a good spokesperson for what his vision for the club kind of was. Yeah. Ten Hag now needs to go and say, like, this is my vision for what the club's going to be and I need you to get on board with it. Because yeah. if he's constantly fighting the board and the players and the fans, and we're only he's, two never, games he's never going to get anywhere. And, we're only two games and he might well do that because he's obviously given Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville an interview ahead of Monday Night Football. Good. So we might all Good. be bowled over by how yeah. eloquent and how steadfast he is in his, his vision. But there is, it's easy to kind of arrive at the, I don't know. Arrive. I think it's important we don't blame Eric Ten Hag though. It's not Eric Ten, Ten well, Hag's fault. Do you opinion. think he shook, the, shooketh after those first two results? Is he going to go from having a, I want this, I all singing, Eric, all dancing, number six at the heart of my side to, oh my God, I probably do need a double pivot because of how poor is my defence I think is. he probably is aware that maybe he has to be a bit more defensive than he was expecting in this division and that he can't go to Brentford and he can't play against Brighton and expect to just dominate the ball and dominate the game in the same way he was able to do in the Edivisor. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Learning from that, we saw Arteta when he first took over at Arsenal, you know, at, I think towards the back end of that first season was kind of playing a three back at times wasn't he and, and had to go a little bit more defensive in order to solidify the rest of the team and it, I don't think that would be the worst decision to go to three at the back as long as he still kept his I, I, kind of ideology overall just to be a bit more defensive because he was such an attractive candidate obviously yeah. goes, goes without saying because he had such clarity but like you've, such you've a got to strong survive. commitment to a style of play you've got to survive right? you yeah, can't just you thing, can't right? commit to a style of play <laughs> he's if in you survival then... mode on no but it's like we say that match about match three. Three. you know not... when we say about players like the best ability is availability like as a manager you do need enough time to transmit your principles yeah. you need to and also adaptable. to clean that squad out because it's going to take you a few windows to and get rid of all the, think, well, I would say, like poisonous presences. Yeah, given squad. the inertia at the start of the window as well, it's probably going to take a little bit longer than we all yeah. anticipated because I've not hit the ground running. Can have you they? believe that? Can you believe that? That like they've yes. gone into this summer with a new manager and they're just Absolutely, like, Absolutely, I can oh, believe it. Um, we're starting oh, with nine no of the same from surprised last season. About yeah. that? We, we went to BBC Gossip page and who are other teams targeting? Oh, this Andrew Martinez, get that f in. Why are we surprised? The United haven't had a plan for a decade. There's no reason that they will suddenly have a plan now. But just Ten because Eric Ten Hag has come through the door, and I'm sure he is mm. an extremely good coach, but behind the scenes, things are still very messy, aren't they? And things are still being put into place or not being put into place. So I think the idea of us having a very solid and clear plan was always going to be a bit sketchy. And I think that what is <laughs> happening now for Eric Ten Hag is he's realising, OK, we need to... To sort some things out in the short term in order to be able to plan for the long term. And yeah. whether or not Casemiro works in that, I think is still up in the air. Compromising his vision in the short term to oh, hopefully yeah. execute something bigger in the long term. Like, we all get that, don't we? But, um, <laughs> but yeah, signing <laughs> Casemiro for 60 million euros, putting him on 250 to 300 grand a week. Uh, it's, it's a big old commitment if it, it doesn't work. Uh, and it's it is risk. kind of reminiscent of. I don't know, Matic or Sanchez, and that you're buying people who are coming out of their prime, perhaps, on a downward trajectory, mm. and the pressure is on them to hit the ground running straight away. There's no doubt about that. And yeah. we don't... This... You can't just sign Casemiro and then have that be the midfield shored up, right? You need other personnel working around him, just like at Real Madrid. He's always been heavily reliant on Cruz and Modric progressing the ball because... He's a, he's a league average passer, isn't he? Probably better than league average. That's probably being a bit, a little bit harsh. But what does yeah. he do? Wins the ball back in the middle of the park, offloads it to to someone better, 
who is that someone better at Manchester United at that current? Well, that's gonna, uh, that is going to be the interesting thing. So the composition of the side, let's, should we yeah. have a quick, quick yeah. look at that? And it's I mean, guesswork, though, isn't it? It's guesswork. Is he going to play a double pivot and he's going to utilise Casemiro alongside Fred, like we see sometimes with the Brazilian national team? Is he going to utilise him as a single pivot and then play Ericsson and Bruno in front of him and try and make something work there? I think... I don't even know whether Eric Ten Hag mm. knows exactly how he's going to utilise Casemiro right I saw now. some pretty interesting stuff on Twitter uh, like highlighting the fact that people think he's really wed to this idea of having a brilliant number six, you know, in the Sergio Busquets mould who will just bypass the press, slip it out to a better player uh, and they go again. But, I mean, here's like various iterations of Ajax. I think it was in the three, four seasons he was Edson there. Alvarez? Yeah, he had very different profiles of play in that role. And Edson Alvarez, for example, was a very sort of combative player that was deployed as a lone six who would win the ball back and then funnel it out wide. But that was because they had unbelievable progression out wide. Like Daily Blind it was, it was like a left back completing, you know, the most final third passes in Europe's top five leagues at, at one point. One, I don't think the head of his top five, but you know what I mean, Europe's, Europe's top leagues. So obviously he had other areas of the, the team making up for that shortfall in creativity in the centre of the park. But but yeah, it is. I, I think he probably will go with Fred. I think he's uh, like McTominay on, on peds, on steroids, uh, Casemiro at the moment, or maybe that's how he envisages that, him in the squad. That is a short-term upgrade, like Pat said at the start, on Manchester United's current midfield options, isn't it? To have Casemiro and Fred is a big step up on what's currently there. But the remaining positional plans, I think... Obviously, they're still up in the air, despite the fact we're coming towards the end of August. Have to be dealt with. There has to be a right back bought in, probably another central midfielder, certainly a striker, if not a striker, an extremely versatile <laughs> forward that can play in multiple roles. I would suggest a goalkeeper is quite badly needed. Um, but, you know, let, if we were to put aside the fact he's, he's like costing an awful lot, yeah. do we like. What do we think of Casemiro as a whole coming to the Premier League? I think, I, for me as a Man United fan, it is quite exciting, even though we've got all these caveats to it. Go on. You're not convinced. <sighs> He's conflicted. Yeah. He's having a big old internal monologue right now. He has done it at the highest level in the Champions League, of course, but he is coming from what is genuinely like a sleepier league. Like, there's a lot of defensive pressing mm. in La Liga. But the pace is slower. The athleticism is much, much lower. Mobility, mobility uh, worries me. Yeah, and that does concern me. I mean, like he presses a lot less than, say, Fred. Fred was at last season about 25 presses a game. Uh, but Casemiro Fred presses a lot. at the wrong time in the wrong area. He's I, just flying out. He's just no, causing chaos. I, yeah, but I think that's there. because I think that's because he's trying to stitch a whole midfield together himself. Yeah. Like the, the guy in your midfield who's the real problem there is McTominay because like the guy literally cannot follow instructions. Um, I think Fred will be able to but like Fred 25 presses a game like Casemiro last season under 16 very similar ball winning about five tackles and interceptions a match and actually Casemiro better in the one-on-one he's more successful with the presses he does commit his passing is slightly better but his running is significantly worse mm. I mean as just a sitting six I it's it's fine I mean the only issue of course is that up until last season when he got about 2500 minutes we were seeing his minutes kind of come down year on year and the worry was, if that continued, what would be his future in this Real Madrid side? And now he's coming to a more ramshackle side in a more difficult league. That concerns me. It also just concerns me that I think at this price point, almost every midfielder in the world is available to you, right? Like, not ones that like rival clubs, but every player at a team that is smaller mm -hmm. than Man United should be gettable. And I think for this 60 mil, you could probably have got, you could have got Ruben Neves on lower wages and you would have probably had a little bit left over there are things like that you could have done which would have both shored up the team now and been progressive moves for the future and so from that point of view I look at Casemiro and I say this is a good defensive midfielder it is a good defensive midfielder but a good defensive midfielder doesn't suddenly make United like Mm. A coherent so side. Yeah. So it problems. stops you conceding yeah. maybe four against Brentford. Yeah, but yeah. so would but so would maybe playing a back three with Lisandro yeah. Martinez on the left of it rather than uh, as a centre. I'm half really intrigued quiet. to see how Ten Hag lines up. In I don't think he's going to be available for Liverpool. I don't think that visa situation no. is going to be sorted in time, right? So I am going to be very interested to see how mm. he lines up when he is first available. Yeah, 31 next season, and I can't envisage like a lot of his defensive numbers dropping off. He's still going to be one of the world's best in his, in his position, isn't he? Like top 10% for midfielders, Europe top five leagues last year for tackles, blocks, clearances, aerial duels. And one interesting stat I did dig out was that he completed five and a half long balls per game as well, which is more than Fred and McTominay combined. Mm. So at least when he wins the ball back, there is a reasonably 
decent chance he's going to be able to spring a counter like with a, a certain degree of uh, I don't know like goodness <laughs> and maybe there is a thought process from Ten Hag there that you know the aerial duels come into, into effect we know that he's bought Lissandro Martinez as very much a ball distributing centre back from deep who can spray those balls out play balls through the lines maybe there is the moments where Casemiro almost comes in alongside Martinez for the mm. long balls and supports him in that role uh, you know these are the sort of things that probably the average football fans and stuff we don't really think about and they probably are planning for you'd hope you yeah. would hope. But I do worry, like, when you talk about him and Fred playing together, and, yeah, they do do it for Brazil. But maybe, like, I don't know, the problems they were trying to solve haven't been fully solved either. Like, mm. Casemiro's carries dropped off last season. Ball His progressive passes dropped off last season. Uh, in my head, that's why bringing in someone like Frankie de Jong made sense, or that's why at least targeting him uh, made sense. Like Maybe the, we still get him. Maybe it's a Casemiro and De Jong. Well, now there's <laughs> talk about bringing in Milinkovic Savic as well yeah. as Casemiro as a replacement for all that De Jong when he had set aside, right? Which still as a combination doesn't really equate to what Frankie was really good at. So it is really difficult to unpick. Like you still lack forward thrust like f- through that midfield. You yeah. still lack, uh, I don't know, someone stitching together Quality defense on the ball to midfield, in midfield to attack. Uh, well, no unless Ericsson drops deep. I, I, yeah. yeah. So uh, we'll see how it ends up, but it's certainly going to be interesting. Well, what do you think about it from Real Madrid's perspective? Because this is another large aging sale that we've seen them do over the last few years. You know, obviously got rid of Varane and they seem to have planned fairly well for this scenario with two many coming in the summer mm. and Camavinga already at the club so I was a bit surprised yesterday when I saw the reaction from Real Madrid fans on my Twitter that weren't happy that he was going and were quite concerned that he was leaving the club because I immediately thought you know too many started on the weekend maybe he was just going to start every game but mm. apparently that's not the case maybe because they were trailing to well Maria right in the opening game of the season mm. like I think Angelotti thought this is a good time to to overhaul my team playing against a side that's just been promoted no but Casemiro didn't start that game he, no that's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying like they had to use all five subs had Modric on, came yeah. on Casemiro came on they obviously overturned that one the deficit 1-2-1 one, one, but didn't look entirely convincing with that new look midfield I think in Ancelotti's head he's probably thinking I'd like to keep this guy for one more year while we complete this transformation from but they don't get the fee yeah they don't get the fee and he's a realist isn't he he's not going to kick up a, a stinker about it um, but but too many are great plan to replace him but one that will probably need a little bit of time to to get comfortable dictating that midfield um i don't know it's, it's i think it is a really good fee but i was arguing with some real madrid fans today that like often real madrid getting a good fee is negated by the fact that they then don't go and spend that money all that well but it doesn't appear like they're gonna target anyone else after casemiro leaves yeah well maybe they are waiting for bellingham like we've seen the reports about bellingham to madrid all summer we? maybe they are waiting next summer and going okay the we'll midfield plan that, is cash. to have camavinga <laughs> bellingham and chuameni going what about forward Valverde, though? well fede Valverde though kind of does operate even when they had the midfield like three he was operating on the right hand side yeah but I think that's because you want him in the team because like you need some legs when you've got Kroos and Modric like when you've got Camavinga and Schuermeni then you can play Valverde in the middle rotation baby and they're going to need another attacker at some stage yeah like they were hoping to get Mbappe for sure and it's going to be you know interesting to see who they go for next summer Uh, should we Keep going with some more panic buys potentially here. I see you've noted I love down. This. I love panic buy season. You normally love it as well, except that this year it's it United, is funny. So like... It is. It, you have to admit it is entertaining. Mm. Well, also United, you... United's transfer window is entertaining. And it's you're guaranteed sh- a nibble if you say someone's a panic buy. It's a sh- show, but it is entertaining. Like over the next oh, 15 wonderful. days, for United to try and buy five players is comedy. This yeah. week, I remembered that United lost four 0 to Brentford the other day, and had also lost at home to Brighton. And I just like, I got like. Unbearably. It's a circus. It's a, it's I just got so happy. It's a circus, isn't it? It's got pure dopamine. It normally happens in a, a week, two weeks' time, right? Yeah. But we had to bring this episode forward because United are just doing a madness. Yeah. You putting in the WhatsApp group that they're going to sign five players in the next 15 days. That's hilarious, man. After Triggered spending this, this episode. Long, uh, all right, let's talk about another name link that people are calling Panic Buy on Twitter. Is Christian Pulisic on loan with an option to buy? Pat. Let's come to you because you've notoriously throughout Sunday Vibes notoriously been, been quite positive about Christian Pulisic when others potentially have called him you know I remember an episode with you saying that you would keep Callum hudson Adoy and Pulisic at Chelsea probably a year ago like by any means possible because of their yeah. potential yeah. and now it looks like this summer both could leave so how do you feel about that? Well Hudson-Odoi is a bit of a difficult situation because like, we don't know what his physical state is 
So mm. it might be that they're like, mm, but but the fact that Chelsea seem to want to keep him permanently and they're only willing to loan him suggests to me that he's not like cooked. And Hudson Odoi to me is like really special. If I had to let one go, I probably would let Pulisic go. Um, I think part of that with Chelsea is because they've gone to the back three and that favours the inside forward types Doesn't rather work, than winger it? types. Yeah. So like Hudson Odoi is much more of a winger than say Kai Havertz. So it kind of makes sense that you want people who are going to play on the inside because your width is coming from the from the wing backs. Pulisic, he's a really good player when he's fit. I think he's excellent. You know, he had that season under Lampard, that COVID season where he was just staggering. Like every time he was on the pitch, he was electric. Um, he's been fit since October. Mm. Sure, but he there are still question marks over his match fitness, right? As in, like they, people have said, does this guy need like? two games a week or does he need like a really slow integration back into like the game and if Chelsea were in a better position maybe they could afford to give him that mm. but because Chelsea also kind of have a point to prove after a bad year it's a difficult position for them I, he's a great player I think he's a great player I think he'd be good for you to have in the squad I honestly think if he was like French like no one would take the piss out of Christian Pulisic <laughs> I think it's entirely about his nationality um but on the other hand... You know, I don't have much depth with. He would be yeah, effectively no one, replacing Antti Alanga's minutes. But no one presses in your attack. That's a problem. That is such a problem. Yeah. You know, like, And there's always the thing of like, oh, well, Sancho came out of the pressing side. and like, well, But none of these guys actually were ever the pressing guys on a pressing side. Mm. Like, you've got now a front line of like, your options are Ronaldo. I mean, who cares? Martial doesn't press. Rashford doesn't press. Sancho doesn't press. Like so, so the, this is why you end up in a situation, you know, like last season with Rangnick, where he's like, I've got to play like a Langer alongside Bruno because then at least I've got two guys who are going to do some running. Like you, you can understand it. So, so my real worry here is like, it doesn't matter how good these players are if you don't have a plan for getting the ball back when it's lost. Otherwise, it'll be yeah. like basketball. It'll be like a team runs down to the end of the pitch, has a shot. <laughs> we hope that the hair saves like, it and yeah. that's how we get the ball back that is what it's Pulisic's like it's not a terrible presser but if you're asking to be a He's great a great presser yeah. or is he physically capable of that that is a concern but is it is I know that that like pressing obviously is a problem for Manchester United from the front but I don't think we're saying here that Christian Pulisic would come in and be like first name of the team sheet anyway it's just a depth I'm option generally, where we haven't got any wide op- options I'm generally pretty positive about this like I do think if you can get him back to those 2019-20 numbers where I think he put up 13 goals and assists in 19 starts even if he just contributes on that front, you know, if he, if he just starts one every two games, like you said, it gives that forward roster a lot more depth. He can play on the left, where he was great in that season. Sort of, I think he's putting up over, I think it's 2.2 dribbles per 90 as well, which no United player has matched since Paul Pogba in 17-18. So a little bit of flair there for you. You've got Sancho back out on the right, where he killed it for Dortmund from 2018 to 2020. And you just have to bite the bullet and play Rashford or Martial up top and yeah. sack off Ronaldo like Ronaldo can't be the Ronaldo cloud just continues to hover doesn't it it's, it's a bad bad stench this uh, and then all of a sudden you've got at least a Europa League looking forward line with potential upside like I, I think yeah. Pulisic he's, but then he's going to go back to Chelsea if he's good he'll just but go there's back to no way United are going to do that loan without an option to buy yeah there's an, op- an option to buy of what 30 to 40 I think it'd be fair for okay. all parties yeah. it'd be fair for Pulisic he's not he went from starting like 19 games to 18 to 13 last season to, to being nowhere f- near it this season and they've signed Raheem Sterling they're after Anthony Gordon for 50 mil that's yeah. crazy um, so he must be sat there thinking if if Todd Bowley's master plan happens I am going to rot on the bench or yeah. just play in the Carabao Cup yeah I, I have to say I kind of agree I, I'm fine with this transfer on loan um, I think United you know, have real depth issues in wide areas and we saw an 80 million euro bid rejected for Anthony this week so clearly that sort of wide forward is something that Ten Hag is in the, is in the hunt for maybe he doesn't rate Anthony Alanga as highly as Ralph Rangnick did and Pulisic is probably an upgrade on Marcus Rashford right now given Marcus Rashford's form um, so I have no problem with it but I don't think it should be targeted as a priority given mm. a striker is much more needed. We have to get a striker through the door and I just do not see a world in which Cristiano Ronaldo can stay. I don't understand it. I think that the opportunity Manchester United have had all summer to say, OK, you want to go? We can agree a deal where your contract is terminated and you can go and pick your club. Well, George sure Mendes was trying to get into perfect. Dortmund, right? Yeah, that's just not going to happen, is it? But I think that that opportunity for United was perfect and they didn't take it and now they're scratching around going oh should we shouldn't we should we shouldn't we when that ha- they had the opportunity 
pre-season, at the start of pre-season to do that. They should have done that and then had two months to focus on signing a striker. That's not happened, and now they're up creek without a paddle. Mm. You probably could have got Tony for about 35 mil, and I really think that would have been interesting for you. I think he'd have been a really good type of front man for the wide attackers that you've got. I, I, it feels like you could have gone and spent 100 million and got Tony and Neves, and I think that you would be in a much better position right now. Oh, like because the, because my issue now is what striker are you going to get? Panic. How much are they going to gouge you for that striker? Huge. Like is the, these things are concerning. <laughs> They're going to gouge us huge. Because otherwise, I kind of agree with Chris. Like if it comes to if it comes to it where you're just going to get absolutely shafted for a mediocre player. Just say, you know what, who cares? And play Martial or Rashford. Yeah, the good B sides have already gone. We discussed this about two weeks ago. You can't we? rely like on Skamaka Martial going to West Ham. Know, and they're not like, fit enough. I know, but but we're saying that the kinds of players that we're talking about, when you get far enough down the yeah. shopping list, you can't rely on them either. And they're expensive. Panics. At least these guys are on your books and you're paying them like, either look way. Look at... I mean, Anthony Modeste obviously did v very well in the Bundesliga last season, Ooh. but he is coming, he's gone to Dortmund as Seb Alice replacement. Couldn't come right? to the Prem though, could he? No, I'm not saying you should have got Modeste. I'm saying look at what Dortmund have had to do in light of not having their yeah. first choice number nine. Like that's, they've been extremely realistic. They've had to take a downgrade, but that just shows you that the pool of, of available strikers... It is slim. It is slim. Is slim. I agree. Suarez has gone to Nacional. But there are still options. That I do believe there are still options. Now we're talking no, about Bamiyang. No, Bamiyang's not going to happen. United have been linked to 22 players in the last 24 yeah, hours. Yeah, but who, is, who, is, who of them could happen? A Bamiyang or Vardy, you'd surely take at current, like with the Ronaldo situation. I wouldn't be taking away. a Bamiyang. I wouldn't take either of them, but like you'd take Vardy over yeah, Bamiyang. I would be taking... Uh, with, what do I want for, uh, this is the problem, <laughs> isn't it? We're, this is how low we've stooped here. This is how low we've stooped. Can we please move on from Manchester United? the best player of those currently. Let's move on away from Manchester United. I want to talk about Morgan Gibbs-White. Oh, now, well, are we you. describing Morgan Gibbs-White as a panic move? I feel like that's harsh because I think Nottingham Forest have been planning for this move for Price an awful long time. Panicky. Can but Can you say it's a panic move when they've had multiple bids rejected? It's a panic fee. You can say it's a panic move when you get the sense that they suddenly feel they could reach the end of this window without Morgan Gibbs White in their squad and so they are paying mm. a genuinely insane amount of but money for the, him their original offer was £25 million I think up front mm. with £10 million uh, of add-ons uh, that to me is the, the the top end of what I yes. would have offered for someone with his ceiling like he was very good in the championship last season but I think mm. prior to that uh, very like productive loan stint with Sheffield United the most games he'd started in a season was five and I know he won the under 17 World Cup I think Steve Cooper was possibly manager he's worked with Steve Cooper at Swansea at Swansea when he was on loan there yeah um, but yeah like ha has a good pedigree but not a lot of minutes S super highly rated yeah yeah obviously su super highly rated was um, the standout performer at Sheffield United last season I think he most for shots joint most key passes joint most dribbles was the most fouled his defensive contribution was really poor. He played on the right-hand side of a 3-4-3, I think, for the majority of his minutes when like, that is where Forrest have become well-stopped, right? Like, Brennan Johnson's there. You could probably play Lingard there. Um, mm. I, it I it feels like they're forcing it. It feels like it's, it's just someone the manager is sort of like... Yeah, lusted after. <laughs> it's an so interesting long, one, isn't but... it? Because they've done so much business. This is the the sixteenth, seventeenth <laughs> signing. I think sixteenth signing. This will be. Yeah, and it will take them up close to the record spenders in the window. Fifteen about... mil more than Zinchenko. Yeah, the same as Calvin Phillips. Yeah, what's going on? I know it is very, very interesting because, I mean, from a Forest fan's point of view, you don't really care, do you? Because you're thinking, do you know what? We've got all these exciting players in. If it doesn't work, if it busts, then say Lavi, we drop down to the championship, we retain 60% of them, and we've got the best squad in the championship. Uh, and and I do get that charge. he could be yeah. the jewel in the crown if they go down to the championship, because they'll obviously have to, they'll have to jettison a lot of players. I imagine he's one of the players that would be like, listen, if we go down and you're sticking with us, you're yeah. going to be one of the players tasked with getting us back up. So in terms of even like if they retain future 50%. proof in a side, I see the logic there. Yeah. But also, 45 yeah, it's million crazy pounds. Money. It's, cra it's crazy money, but Forrest apparently have that money to spend if the owner's there willing to spend it and Steve Cooper has him as the guy then how do you say no to Steve Cooper in that situation mm. you, you've got to back your manager and I get, agree it's, it's, it's a lot of money and even if they get relegated the parachute payments will probably cover it because while yeah. they've gone and, yeah. while they've gone and got like they've done some punchy transfers those players wage wise are probably not that insane so like going and getting Awani from like from the Bundesliga like that's a that's a punchy move for Forrest 
but I doubt his wages are like totally insane. No, they'd no. be marginally insane in the champ, but like you can tolerate it with parachute payments. And Joe's right, like, if, they, if they go down with this squad, this squad would be like laughing yeah, better but, than everybody else in the champ. Well, they will have to sell a fair share. Like, yeah, but even if they sold 50%, they'd have yeah. eight players I'll, that have come in at Premier League standard. Could, I think, yeah, they could have hour. I think you divide, you can the divide the recruitment almost into two halves. Like, this is who's staying with us in the championship if we go yeah, down. This I is agree. who will probably Nico sell Williams. on. Uh, for a profit, like yeah, I think Nico Williams is probably their only overpay oh, at eighteen mil, and oh, I think I he's think a very. I think that's a fair fee. I actually think Nico. No, I think a fair it will prove to be a fair yeah. fee, but they had to pay over what they wanted to over like three, four times his market value to get it over the line. I actually like, tweeted the other day in that match against West Ham. I thought he was the best player on the Definitely. pitch by a distance. He's, he's he, he to replace Jed Spence with Nico yeah. Williams is some business. But like if they if they get out off ten fifteen and he impresses in the prem like. They're, they're going to feasibly add value to these players as well and may, maybe yeah. sell them on at a profit. They're, going yeah. to end up, they're, they're a promoted club who are going to end up playing like a midfielder of like Freuler, Aua, like then they're going to have Gibbs White and Aua Nii. Like. Well, Freuler was only there. nine. It's outrageous. And his market value is like 22. I think, I think like Lingard... I think, they've had, a, I, I think they've had a great window. Lingard I like pretty much no, all their still. buys. This is a <laughs> massive overpay. <laughs> yeah. like, there's no doubt about it, but I, I reckon that at least a big chunk of that, of those add-ons will be if we stay up. Oh, definitely. And and in that case, you're just like, give. Yeah. We stay up, like we'll give them 15 mil. We don't care. And it's it. Prem come, money, baby. It, it does come down to the fact as well that like the squad that they had was like really like mid-table Listen, championship I, packed out with low knees we so all bought into went, the fact they had to have a massive overhaul and then we all got sort of infatuated with him because of how how good the business was and then they paid 45 mil for Morgan Gibbs White and I just think the stats community the, the football nerds on Twitter just felt a little bit betrayed because it felt like it was almost a flawless summer and this is this is the exaggerated move within yeah. a cluster of very good moves. Yeah, let's go to some of the fan suggestions because one of them does relate to this move right. and that's uh, Mateus Nunes to Wolves. Now, what Wolves have done right. here is they've sold Morgan Gibbs-White for 45 million and they've signed Mateus Nunes and Gonzalo Guedes for basically 15 million net, which is, I mean, some business, isn't it? Yeah, they've massively overpaid for Guedes. Do you think? Well, how much is Guedes? 30 mil. Pounds. Yeah. I think he was worth that at some point. I'd, I've but not really not tracked his yeah. progress at Valencia. Mm. He's not that. It's not that long, surely. It was. It was five years ago that he put up really good numbers. Wow, We're old man. Like his his numbers have got worse over the last five years. He was injured a lot, but last season I think it was like maybe it was like something like 15, 16 Valencia goal involvements cat, in Valencia. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Playing like, under the old Hatafe manager who plays total are... terrorist football. Yeah, but what, what do Wolves do? Like, Wolves yeah, are... Oh, wolves, <laughs> the buccaneering so Wolves. Well, can like, you respect Bruno Large because he's moved to a back four. He's utilising Nathan I, Collins and I, Max Kill. I don't care, man. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not that worried about Wolves whereas everybody else seems to think they're like nailed on to go down. But like, to me, Wolves having a good season is not going to be about like Guedes landing and being great, right? It's about Net, Neto coming back fit and being mm. good. I don't know, like, maybe maybe he works, but about five years ago, he was closing in on 0.5 expected goals and assists per 90. Now he's down at around 0.3. His shot numbers are okay. He doesn't work very hard. Better uh, his numbers dribble numbers have Quang. got worse and worse. Like, he's just, it's fine, but, like, it's kind of like when Leeds paid 30 mil for Dan James. I was like, I don't mind a club signing Dan James, but 30 million pounds, I do, that, that's nuts. <laughs> I, and it's so, and, and actually Leeds kind of do that every summer. Like, they, they kind of overpay for everyone they get. But, like, in, this, in this case, like, Guedes, it's like... What about Nunes, then? Can we have some Wolves positivity? Because that feels like a yeah, coup. I didn't mind the Guedes one too much. much. I haven't watched enough Nunes to have a real concrete opinion on it. I mean, uh, that's got to be a major coup, given the Champions League level clubs that were interested in Mateus mm. Nunes. But that's all we're going on. Yeah. That's it. You're like, oh, well, he, he wanted it. And it's, also, like, it's like, it's like, it's like, we're, like you, you going to a bar or something with like your hottest friends. So that people would be like, oh, he's got hot friends. So I guess he's like hot by like a transitive property. Like it's like the same. It's the same thing going on. It's just like, oh well, you know, technically Liverpool wanted him, did they? Like, this is you. You've been a Man United fan for so long <laughs> that now you're like somebody else was linked with him. He must be good. Get him in. Sign him up. And it's like, okay, yeah, fine. I mean, look, Wolves. Wolves basically have at this point a recruitment policy more restrictive than like Athletic Bill Bowes. They're just like you have to be f-ing Portuguese. If you're not Portuguese. Like, get out of here. It's a crazy number now. Yeah. 
But also, what Liverpool weren't willing to deal at the the aforementioned fee, were they? They're they're not so, going to. Yeah, they no, were like, we're not paying forty million quid. No. Which does make me think like he's not worth forty million quid yeah, then, but, because. But maybe he's tends to wolves. Nailed down. Maybe he's to wolves. I know wolves fans are extremely excited, so I don't think we should be poo pooing this. Yeah. At least they're doing something. But you said for ages and, they need a midfielder. And Joao Moutinho is like approaching the Very age old. of it, zero yes. frames, isn't he? Yeah. Exactly. And he basically, I think they all thought as well that Ruben Neves was going to leave. Let's not forget the scenes at the final Wolves game last year when he was oh, doing the lap, cl- crying and clapping. Yeah. And he, well, he like, did yeah, it. So finally, to have him still there and Nunes is impressive. And s- something about Wolves that might interest me. Nah. <laughs> Harsh. <laughs> Pat's a Wolves nah. hater. Uh, let's talk about Kukurea, another suggestion. Would you describe him as a Lol. panic buy? I would not. How can you describe Kukurea as a panic buy? What is mm, borderline it's just in the same genre as Morgan Gibbs White. Like, I'm not saying he's not a good player, which everyone tries to straw man you on Twitter. Literally, the argument is not me saying Kukure is not a good Seems player. Like it is. I've liked him since Ibar. But here we are, like, with him as what the most expensive fullback of all time. Getting his hair tugged about by Chris Romero. £60 million. Pounds. For Kukurea. 62, if all the add-ons are. Alright, let's move away from Kukurea then. Yeah, we spoke oh, about him so done? much. It's a <laughs> huge, about Anthony huge Gordon? Gym. Actually, I don't, I don't think you were here when we spoke about Kukurea. Though. I don't think I was. So, uh, do you want to get your opinion you got, slipped yeah, in there? 10 seconds on Kukurea. Not particularly. Like, I just think it's an absolutely ludicrous use of resources. The funniest thing about it, I think, was Chelsea trying to dunk on Bryson on Twitter. Yeah. You're like, oh, wow, well done, Chelsea. Like, you've massively overpaid for a player they played for a year. <laughs> and they've gone and got Pevis Estupinian off, off like Villarreal, who went to the Champions League semis last year. For 16 mil. They didn't give a f- Like, don't try and dunk on somebody who's had you over a barrel. Like, you can't do it, but that's typical of Chelsea. Um, and speaking Anthony of them Gordon. having had over barrel, what are they doing with Anthony Gordon? <laughs> they're like 40 million and Everton are like, Everton, Everton are like... Everton rejected two bids. Everton are like this, this object lesson of like, what happens if you have like this one inexplicable great fear that doesn't actually matter at all? So like, Everton have, the, the biggest fear that Everton have is that they will be like a selling club a club without ambition. So everything Everton have done for the last 10 years was always about, we must show ambition. The important thing is to show ambition. It's not to be ambitious and smart, it's to show ambition. So they always said that about like keeping John Stones back in the day. And now they're doing it again where they're just like, oh, we won't be tempted by 40 mil or 45 mil for Anthony Gordon. It's like, you should be tempted. <laughs> like, for, sp- he is not worth that. Yeah. Like, he's not worth that. He's, he's done almost nothing so far. His numbers are pretty middling. Like there's promise there when you watch him. Like he's got he's got something. He's got yeah, a spark, sure. but he's got nothing. He hasn't got a spark where you're like, holy, shit, this might be a superstar. He's got a spark where you're like, this might be a good Premier League player. His physical Chelsea. attributes are unreal. Like how many defensive pressures he puts up per night, for ex- for an example. And I think there is at the heart of Bowley's recruitment this summer that he's put like physicality. At the, at the forefront is like can this guy Raheem run Sterling, like yeah unit Kukurea like can 19 this... year old Inter Milan midfielder unit <laughs> yeah. 31 year old Kaladu Koulibaly get him in yeah where is he going to play I suppose, where is he going to play I suppose you're physical back. in a different where's sense with Koulibaly but um, they do 50 mil on Anthony Gordon where the hell does he fit in but he's this, literally not better than any of them we're also not talking about the opportunity time. cost as well like letting Callum Hudson-Odoi go letting Pulisic go to facilitate a move for Anthony Gordon for 50 mil which Everton after all their business over the last five years cannot afford to turn down by the way yeah. I'm not just talking about FFP or I know mashiri has got money and they've got other financial backers but just for sat like sanity but then Safe. they would have lost Richarlison and Anthony Gordon and Dominic Cavill is out for three months like what Anthony yeah, Gordon yeah, but, does not yeah. hit, lift them up the table yeah. he's not the difference between finishing not, 11th and 12th I would say that as well that what Anthony Gordon does now is actually extremely well covered by Dwight McNeil Dwight McNeil we know can at the very least do all the defensive work and a lot of the ball progression like he can do that stuff mm. and at a certain point, you can't just be like, oh, we just won't do anything forever. I guess we'll just sit here and keep the same squad until we all die. Like, at a certain point, you have to back yourself to rebuild the squad. I can see why Everton wouldn't, because they're terrible at it. But they can't just say, we just won't do it. We just won't do it. Like, you've got to take... This is... A... It's like the Casemiro thing. May It might hurt you in some ways, sure. But the money is such an enormous overpay that you have to take it and plan for the future because they can't just rely. Mm. Otherwise, Calvert-Lewin will run down his contract and then he'll just go. And yeah. then they're left with 
literally the nothing. The truth is, it doesn't have to make sense because the Premier League is a land of milk and honey and 50 mil is a f***ing drop in the ocean now. <laughs> and it renders this <laughs> show and this channel f***ing obsolete because nothing makes sense and anymore. But at... Southampton rebuilt the whole team for 50 mil. A whole yeah, new spine. Well. They, 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 they did well. do a very good job. Oh, wow. Well. Really it's not well. very good. Hassan was, <laughs> Hassan was a week away from losing I, I, his job and they're, <laughs> they're, in the bottom, they're in the bottom three. <laughs> but if you go Brighton 50 mil, like Brighton, be, Brighton would... Do bits. All right, so while we're talking about huge Chelsea overpayments, can we discuss 80 million on Fafana? Well, I yeah, resent so how disdainful you've been about uh, Southampton, it's by the way, but we'll ludicrous. come back to that. Do you think Southampton are going to have a good season? No, I think they'll finish like 13th or 14th. Oh, that's kind. I think Southampton they finished They finished 15th last season. They'd be an improvement, wouldn't it? The goals for Southampton. No, let's not get sucked back in Southampton. Who scores them? Guys, who cares? <laughs> okay, let's talk about Fafana very briefly then, because a supposed £85 million bid is on the way here, a world record fee for a central defender. Is this a panic buy? Panic fee? Yeah. Is it? Have we established this, as the birth of the panic fee this summer over, over no, but, just generic panic buy? No, but that is what a panic buy is, right? It's like you saying we would rather pay over the odds and just to get this guy in. Like rather than just like keep mm. our powder. But drink, I also like, think a panic buy is the wrong profile. Like you're getting the wrong profile of player as well. Whereas panic fee is like the. I right don't think it has to be though. Like because when Kepa, you know, panic, panic like, when Arsenal went yeah. and bought like a bunch of players on the last day of the window in like 2011, <laughs> Arsenal got like Per Mertesacker, Mikel Arteta, and a couple of other guys like on the last day of the window, Kim and Pouch. and everyone was no, that was a different. One. That was a different panic. <laughs> um, everyone was just like, oh, these are panic buys, and you're like, they were objectively panic buys, but they also turned out to be amazing signings like you can have a panic buy that works out you know and so if and for Fana, like i don't think anyone thinks he's bad but it is i mean it's a hilarious fee for a guy who's got essentially one good season i like for Fana, but if chelsea want to spend 80 mil on a former San etienne defender they could offer it to arsenal for saliba because he's got two years left on his deal and, and i would say be, no i won't be yeah but look saliba if saliba refuses to sign a new contract he could have a really good season in the Premier League, have a year left on his deal next year, and be in a position to go to like a genuine super club and just leave Arsenal behind. Juve will give him four hundred thousand pounds, and then he'll go to Bayern for a cup price. But you see deal. what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? Like when, when we talk, it's the same thing as Casemiro. When we're talking about eighty million pounds, almost any defender in the world is available to you. Mm. Fafana is a good player. But they I have no join. idea how good. They I wouldn't be surprised join. if Fafana was just fine. They got to want to join. They tried to chuck eighty million at, at Matthias de Ligt, and he went. No thanks, I'll go to Bayern for 20 million less. Yeah, sure, but that's fine. They were competing against Bayern. They're, like, Bayern have now done that. How many other clubs in the window right now who are bigger than Chelsea are looking for a centre-back and can afford to pay more than Chelsea? Mm. Juve are there, but Juve don't have the same money yeah. and are dog <laughs> Like, Chelsea can definitely outdo pretty much everybody on the market yeah. for a centre-back. And yeah. also, as for Farnar, hugely appealing to go to Chelsea on to play in a back three in a Thomas Tuchel system as well because yeah. you are nowhere near as exposed and everyone will be hailing you as the next big thing because you've put up you know, good defensive numbers in a unit marshaled by Thiago Silva who's probably somewhat embarrassingly still one of the best like 5, 10 defenders in the world despite yeah. being 48. Like, I mm. think he is desperate to go. Leicester could, Leicester desperately need the money. Uh, Leicester couldn't turn down 85. They've turned down... 70, I think. They've turned down lesser offers, right? Because they know that Chelsea will eventually stump up what they want. But be, then... They're not going to have time to do it. The next two weeks is going to be gold it's dust in the market, too, too late for Leicester. Yeah. Like, they need to thin the squad my, badly. My, they've got, 20, they've got, they got, plan, they've got possible, a 27-man squad. Is it not possible that Leicester do have a plan ready to go and as soon as some money comes no. in, they're like, right, one, May, two, three. Probably with the Tiedemans. And probably for the 30 mil with Tiedemans. I back them to, to go out and... Like, I don't know if that's going to happen, man. I wouldn't be surprised if he's doing like the Ruben Neves, like, oh, sorry, guys, I thought I was leaving. <laughs> like, like, walk around, the, reverse walk around the stadium. <laughs> uh, should we do some quick fires? Some very short quick fires. Let's just sure. do like one or two. These are all from Discord, by the way. So come over to Discord if you want to submit your questions. That's where we're taking the quick fires from for now. Uh, you mentioned him there, but a stupid man. Yeah. Good signing. Definitely, yes or no? Definitely a good signing. Especially if he's going to play as a wing back, I think. Um, we liked him like for a long time. He actually had a really interesting habit of popping up in the box and mm. getting, getting good shots. Uh, but always had good defensive numbers, real engine on him. Um, seems like actually a very, very sensible replacement for, for Kukurea. And it just doesn't surprise me. More importantly, if he turns up and actually it turns out he's not as good a one-on-one -on -one defender as you'd like or he he's not as good at getting into the final third as you'd like, I just back Potter to work out a system. Yeah. Potter actually, I think, has something of the Conte about him, which is that Conte doesn't look at players 
Conte looks at players quite often who nobody else would like and he says it doesn't matter that he can't do X or Y he can do this one thing and that's what I need him to do and I will find a way to maximise that and I think Potter's really good at that as well he says you know he played like Adam Lallana in central midfield because he's like he can't run and he's not really going to defend but he can do like one or two things that I need him to do and so I, I, I think that's a great move and to, to get a player of a club that went to the Champions League semi last season to Brighton yeah it's crazy. Is, is, is amazing like I mean it says so much and about the strength of the, like we just have a European Super League and it's called the Premier League and Dan Ashworth is gone now and David Weir I think is their director of football yeah. yet this brilliant logic yeah, yeah remains the club yeah. It's a baby. shining example to United of yeah. how to run. <laughs> it is. It a is. Modern day. And how fact, to run a small sports. football. And then, in <laughs> fact, let's not, forget, let's not forget that United approached Dan Ashworth to take a job at the club. I did. I did year, forget that. A year ago. Right. And it didn't happen. I think so. Michael Cox like actually has destroyed your club. Why? Because Michael Cox was like, his, his kind of uh, little cause, right? Was the like, anti-Rangnick. Was the whole Rangnick yeah. thing. Where he was like, I can't believe that they signed him up, like, as manager who hadn't coached for years. And it turned out he was crap. Like, what do you expect? But by doing that, he kind of managed to create this narrative that Rangnick like, kind of knows nothing about football. And you're like, Rangnick might not have coached that much recently. Mm. But objectively, there is no one better in the world at like ripping up your structure and putting in a working system for being a profitable, sensible football club happen, that's you know. good on the pit. Like, so they should have just said to him, yeah, you know what? This was a disaster year. Like, it, 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 it really weakened his position by having him as coach because if he'd just been like yeah, a kind of backroom consultant, I think he could have actually fixed your club. Such a bad coach. Uh, but <laughs> let's do a personal question to wrap it up then because we have been rabbiting on. This one from Adit who says, one fashion statement you now regret. Life. Could be this shirt in a year's time. No, nah, nah, this shirt's a good one. This is fire. This shirt's is. good from you. Uh, fashion statement. I remember, I have to, I'm going to go in early Rings. doors with, do you remember the chinos and Rihanna T phase? Do you ever remember yeah, that? Yeah, that's just being a man. ute. Yeah, but that was horrendous, Rihanna. man, wasn't it? And also, do you remember the Every, everything for slick top down fringe <laughs> and then the rest of the hair spiked up phase? Oh, did you have that? The bill cream phase. Only to a minor level. I can yeah. imagine you had it heavy. Absolutely. The straighteners phase, that was one. I had the back of my hair. I grew it out like a little yeah, mullet and it. then I had it dyed Wild. blonde. Oosh. Yeah, and I remember sitting in <laughs> the uh, like hairdressers with like three... 70 year old women who were getting like the the purple wash what would you call that um purple yeah, rinse, yeah. Right? uh purple rinse good from you and uh for because i had to have it for in foil for like an hour thinking i might have made a mistake <laughs> awful what about you pat yeah i mean like Look the straight, the straight and hair period was not amazing when i was like 14 15 like it's just bad for your hair as well did you but, have like, GHDs? pretty much every oh, did i ever but um, nice. I don't know pretty much everything like, like it was all bad okay so that's it for another episode of Sunday Vibes anything you want to push to? no no not, not, not nice any, not anymore uh, Perhaps that. well yeah I mean go and watch uh, our explain from Saturday on Harry Maguire we tried to break up our relentless onslaught of transfer news with uh, something on Maguire to you know lift, lift your spirits as if you haven't had enough Manchester United content we well, now they just make it so easy, don't they? They do, but it's Man United Liverpool on Monday, and uh, that is going to be a bloodbath. Uh, a bloodbath. So. So. That could be double figures. Would and be amazing. if you want to know any more about the stories that we've been talking about on this week's episode of Sunday Vibes, scan the QR code on screen right now, and it will take you to the Transfer Center or the Sky go. Sports app. Perfect. Thanks very so much for watching.